<laughs> Ik dacht al, hè. Moment. Ja. Oké, okay, René, hoor je me nu goed? Hoor je me nu dubbel of niet? Heb je hem aanstaan trouwens of niet, die, uh, die schakelaar? Nu ja, oké, oké. Okay, okay. Dus uh, als het goed is, uh, moet je hem hier uh, horen. Goed één keer, hè? geen dubbel. Uh... Nee, zeker. Ja, is dat goed? Ja. Oké. Okay. Het is alleen als heel hier kant voor. Welk? Als je, als je hier, moet je eens luisteren. Oh, als, je, als je die andere ook aan hebt. Als je deze aan hebt. Ja, maar dan moet je die gewoon even. Oké, ik word gewoon weer het hoofd. En dan zet je die gewoon. Je mee laag hoor. Tess, Tess. Deze is. Uh, die... Je kijkt ze mee? Dus als ik uh, nu uh, klets ben, dan. Ja, ja. Ja? Moet je me kijken, René, als je, als je klets. Want, uh, want die Cam 2 die stond helemaal, uh, helemaal open. Okay. Maar die kun je hiermee bedienen, hè? Uh, zwarter zetten. En harder. En dan zie je dat hier ook in die. Uh... Ja, oké. Okay. Oh, nee? Dus als ik nu harder zet, dan hoor je uh, wat harder. Ja, dan word je gek. Ja, maar ik zou die gewoon echt, echt bij vragen alleen pas open doen. Dus dan gewoon uithouden en dan gewoon een microfoontje hier gebruiken voor de spreker. Ja. ja. Ik zal even kijken of die ka deze kamer wat meer licht kan geven. Het is wel een stuk lekker te luisteren als wat ik net had. Ja. Wat dubbele geluidje ook. Oh, yeah. Ja, dat is wat, uh, wat, uh, wat meer uh, licht hebben we nu gezet. Ja. Oké, okay. nou top. Dan uh, wacht ik druk even de OBS.
<laughs> to, uh, we have to do it in English. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, then, then I'll just switch into English and uh, the Dutch people just have to bear with me with my scuffed English every now and then. Um, let's just start a little bit in Dutch. Goedemiddag, guten Mittag, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, my presentation about Keycloak. I don't know if maybe some people are already a little bit knowledgeable about security. Some people probably had nothing to do with security yet. Uh, I know some developers are totally not interested in security as long as the stuff works. Um, I was one of them. Um, but I just want to explain a little bit what is happening in the background, pretty much. One of them is Kiko. Kiko can do a couple of things. I'll explain everything that there is to know, or at least in the basics, because if I'm going to explain everything, then we'll be here for the next couple of weeks. Uh, let's just uh, first uh, introduce myself. My name is Anamie Kustal. I am a Java developer at First Aid. First Aid is located in Nijmegen. Uh, and I am the team lead of the Keycloak team. Uh, within the Keycloak team, we are helping, of course, everybody who is having any questions concerning securing their applications, uh, even governments who are asking to secure their websites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, First Aid is um, a specialist in Java and open source de uh, software development. Uh, we have approximately, hello, hello. good afternoon. Uh, we have approximately 40 professionals, so we're, we're like moderately big. We're not like massive, but we're not small at all. Uh, and we are part of Conclusion. Uh, if people maybe heard of Conclusion before, we had a pretty intense uh, advertisement last summer, I think it was. Um, so maybe some people might have heard about it. Um, so within Conclusion, we have like sub businesses. First Aid is part of that one. Uh, we now have over 25 of IT and business oriented businesses. Uh, we are still growing also internationally. I think we are now also going towards Germany. Yeah, yeah, yeah we are. Going to yeah, Germany. Germany uh, we are also in Portugal and South Africa. Um, we now have over 2,500 employees and still growing. But you're not interested in all of that. Let's just start with Keycloak. Um, before we start with Keycloak, we are going all the way to the beginning. And that is about I am. You, you hear it about us sometimes, like I am this, I am that. So what is I am? We're talking about identity access management. Very simple. So if we want a, yeah, come in, come in, welcome, welcome. <laughs> So I was looking for, uh, online to uh, see an entire explanation about I am. Bear with me. So identity and access management is a security and business discipline that includes multiple technologies and business processes to help the right people or machines to access the right assets at the right time for the right reasons while keeping unauthorized access and fraud at bay. Can we now inhale? Yes, please. I have one more like nice summary for this. Your data is secure. It's simple as that. Most people are saying like your data is secure, right? That's pretty much what IAM is. They're making sure that you can reach your data, nobody else. Very simple. So IAM is pretty much broken down into like three subjects. We have identification, authentication, and authorization. So with identification, who are you? Say your name or your username, whatever. Then you have authentication, proof that you are indeed the person that you say you are. And then you have authorization. What permissions do you have? Are you allowed to delete something, access something, edit something? And you can pretty much see it also the same in like a driver's license. I know for the people in Germany, your driver's license look a little bit different. Uh, but this is like a Dutch driver's license. So identification, say, this is your name. That's your identification. But I can also say I'm Tina Turner. Doesn't mean I am indeed Tina Turner. 
Authorization, prove that you are you. Well, you can give them your driver's license, you also have your picture on there. It all proves that you're indeed the person that you say you are. Then authorization. On the back of our Dutch driver's license, they are saying what vehicles you are allowed to drive. That's authorization. So for instance, it's saying that you're not allowed to drive a semi-truck, but you are allowed to drive a car. It's very simple. Same basics also go for pretty much all web applications. Sometimes you're not allowed to access something. I think most of you some somewhere in your career 401 unauthorized. Very simple. But it can also go wrong. If you don't do it right, or if you miss something, or maybe the hackers are just too smart, sometimes that happens, it can go really wrong. For instance, uh, was it last year, October, 23 and week? 23andMe is a, a genetic mapping company uh, where you can just send your DNA, they will map it, and they will say what kind of background you have. Um, in October, hackers found a breach, and they stole almost 7 million genetic data from seven, almost 7 million people. Now you're, like, now you're like, oh yeah, it's just DNA, right? Like, I have DNA, just a drop of blood, that's it. But it can also be used very maliciously. Say people want to see, like, if they want to be a racist, you know? If um, they are looking for Jewish people. Yeah, something like in Israel, which is like very current right now, you want to know different races because they are against each other. You don't want to have that all public. So you want to make sure that it is secure. And sure, it, hackers are, it's always a cat and mouse, right? Hackers are always in front of you trying to be in front of the hackers and they are just running after you. So in 2021, this is a research from 2021, you can see like sure there are some security issues, but the biggest issue from breaches is password guessing. And password guessing, you can pretty much, in a lot of cases, you, you can just make it more secure. Say, for instance, people are not allowed to type in 12345 as a password. Or for the Dutch people, welcome 01. I think every, a lot of people know that. Welcome 01. Um, so you can, for instance, say blacklist certain passwords. People are not allowed to use those passwords. And hopefully we can get this percentage a little bit lower. That would be nice. And then you would think as a developer, wow, this sounds easy enough, right? I can do it myself. I'm a developer. I can make it all. Just a little database, username, passwords, maybe a little bit of encryptions in the back. Easy peasy. But think of all the other stuff that is around it. It's not just a username and a password. It's also a person wants to reset their password. Uh, the person needs to create an account. Uh, we need to assign roles, authorization. We need to assign roles. And that's just the basics. How about social logins, uh, two-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Are we still jumping to make all of that? I think most people here are more like, I just want to have my application up and running. Besides that, it's also easy to make mistakes. You're like, okay, I'll just use a standard encryption. But encryptions can get broken. They can get breached. But then, you need to be on top of everything. And of course, the world keeps changing. Hackers become smarter. New technologies are coming in here every single week, month, year. You want to be on top of that because if you just let it hang, you can guarantee that the hacker will find a bridge for you. In comes Keycloak. You don't have to make it yourself. 
It's just readily available. You can just go to keyclock.org and just download the whole thing. You don't even have to pay. So Keyclock already has a lot of functionalities for you. Say, just a classic login, username, password, nothing wrong. Then we have OAuth 2 and Open ID Connect. I think a lot of people already heard about Open ID Connect. Uh, then you have like uh, federated logins or social logins, login through Google, login through Facebook, login through GitHub, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then we have also a protocol called SAML for the Dutch people, uh, DigiD. They're talking in a certain way, which is not OpenID Connect. It's a different protocol that they're talking in. And of course, passwordless Touch ID, Face ID, authentication apps, etc. It's all there, all ready for you to use. And of course, you can also use certain access control par paradigms. Um, the most, uh, the most used one is, of course, the, the role-based access. So people who are working in the back end, most of the times if you write a Raspberry API, you check for a certain role that you're receiving, right? Based on that role, they can make use of that REST API. There are also others, not as popular. I haven't seen it yet, but hey, they exist. Uh, Policy-based or attribute-based, I'm not gonna go into that. You can write, uh, like, look into it if, if you are interested into this. Um, the, I, I have never really seen it being used anywhere. But they are there, and they are being used. So say I want to log in. Um, this is a website from uh, the Dutch government if you want to uh, want to apply for a subsidizing, then you need to log in. So we say, uh, we go log in, and uh, we type in our stuff, and uh, presto, you're in. You don't see anything what's happening in the back. So there are two ways from Keycloak that we can log in. We can go directly to, to Keycloak. Keycloak is asking like, hey, username, password, Keycloak itself, manages the account and knows everything about you, gives back the rules, super easy. And then you have like the federated IDs or social IDs like DigiID, Facebook, Google, etc. Those are pretty much third party applications that are managing the accounts for Keycloak. So instead of like Keycloak is knowledgeable about your account, the third party is knowledgeable about the account, and the third party is giving back all the information to Keycloak. Keycloak is making like a nice little token for you, gives it back to you or to your application. So there are multiples. This is just like a tiny list. Uh, we have uh, Facebook, Google. Uh, I don't think Twitter is not there anymore, right? <laughs> Let's just blow that one up, it's X. Um, but of course, we also have uh, the trusty old uh, LDAP, Active Directory, for those Windows lovers among us. Yes, I'm cringe. Uh, and of course, for the Dutch people, we have DigiID, AHR Kenning. AHR Kenning is for the, the it's, it's pretty much a DigiID for businesses. Uh, I'm sure the German version is also, you also have like some sort of like government login no, you don't do that yet? Okay, Not yet. <laughs> you, st you still need to go into the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> one day, one day you will get there. Okay. <laughs> oh, we have stuff. Like we have around about 17 different markets. We have the federal and 16 for every state. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's amazing. Well, <laughs> let us all contact us. We can do everything at once then. Okay. All right, so let's go into like the flow. Say you want to log in. What happens? User, which is you. You have the application, which of course is the application. You have the service, which is the backend that has all the data for you. And of course we have Keycloak here on the left side. So a user is saying to the application, I want to reach my data. 
then the application is saying, that, well, that's nice, but uh, I have no idea who you are. Go to Keycloak. So then we are saying to Keycloak, hey, Keycloak, I want to access my stuff. And Keycloak is like, nice. Here's a login page. Give me your credentials. So the user is giving their credentials, username, password. Keycloak is like, yeah, all right, nice. I know who you are. You've proven who you are. Then he's saying to the application, hey, this user is allowed to get into your application. Then the application is like, okay, nice. I know who the person is. And Keycloak is saying he is allowed to get in. Hey, Keycloak, give me an access token from that person. And after that, after then Keycloak gives back the access token. And with that access token, we can go to the back end where most of us developers finally get there. And right at the end, after all the ping pong, then we get there as a back end developer, like, hey, we get a token, we can give you your resources or your data or whatever you're requesting. So you see, there's a lot of like ping pong that you don't really see because pretty much when you say like, hey, I want to log in, you just see a like, nice little screen, you, you type in your credentials and uh, bam, you're in. But there's a lot of communication. And just imagine if there's a third party, like a federated ID or a social ID, then the authentication will go all the way here where the third party is. But just know, if you're giving your credentials, you're seeing that the application has no idea what your credentials are. You're just giving them straight to Keycloak. It will also be a little bit dangerous for the application to know your credential. You don't want your application to know your password. You don't want that. You just want one person or like one application to know everything. You don't want to share it oh, everywhere. You're not gonna yell your password here in the room, right? You don't want to do that with your application either. So besides just your regular password, you can also go passwordless. Yeah, that's, that's like more of the current. That's like up and coming, right? So we have the Microsoft Authenticator app or the Google Authenticator app. Most of the times we're using that for two-factor authentication, but you can also just use it just as your credentials. Touch ID, face ID. Face ID is like from the last couple of years, right? Like to get into your phone, hold it in front of your face, you're in. It's pretty much password. Your face is your password right now. Yes. Oh, you mean you want to use your Windows credentials just to get into uh, somewhere? That's a possible point, but I didn't use Windows. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there is something called uh, web authent uh, authentication. Uh, that, that's pretty much also what this is, passwordless. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can pretty much use anything that you can get out of your system for that, as long as you know how to configure it, of course. But pretty much anything that has credentials, which can also be a finger, a face. Think of anything that can identify yourself with. You can use that to log in, to get into an application. And I'm sure there will be a lot more in the coming years to identify yourself, which is also a little bit scary. All right, what does Keycloak look like? Live demo, all right. For those who know, uh, who've given live demos before, uh, everybody knows, uh, yeah, <laughs> like that. Uh, everybody heard about the demo effect? All right, well, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so, let's just go into Keycloak. This is Keycloak. Or at least the, the, the front page of the Keycloak. So if we log into Keycloak, 
I'm going to give my uh, super duper secret uh, login. <laughs> super secret. <laughs> super secret. Um, this is pretty much uh, what Keycloak looks like. It, it is pretty, like, pretty easy to find your stuff. So the absolute basics are just easy to find. And I'm I'll just go through a couple of stuff. Up here you have realms. Realms are pretty much like um, an object where you can put in all your applications that have to do with the same thing. So for instance, uh, you can use your, uh, a realm for um, uh, development and a realm for testing and a realm for production. And everything that has to do with development, testing or production, you put in that realm. Then, we have the clients. There are already a couple clients in there. It's, it's a bit hard to see because like the, the yeah. beamer, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but there are a couple clients that are already in there. For instance, like an account client. An account client is pretty much an application. So pretty much an application that we're talking to or listening to. So Keycloak already has an account. So say if we go to the home URL, which is like localhost 8080 realms workshop. And so we say we go into the realm, which is called workshop, and we want to go to the account page. It's already predefined for you. And of course, um, I made these two clients. You will see later what that has to do with it. It's for later in the, uh, in the example. Then you have the realm roles. Every role that has to do with something with Realm. Sounds simple enough, right? There are also a couple of roles that are already predefined. For instance, default role. So every user that we're making gets the default role. And you can decide for yourself what you want to put in those default roles. So the default role can also, again, consist of different roles. So a role in a role. Of course, users. Nothing to say about that. I think it's pretty clear what we have in here. The users, of course. And of course, there are many, many more things that I can go through. I'm not going to do everything because, again, it will take a long time. The only thing I want to show you is identity providers. Identity providers, so this is where you configure your third parties. So if you don't want Keycloak to manage your account, but a third party. There's already a lot of stuff that's already here for you. Of course, I think the easiest one that everybody can do is uh, connect to GitHub. Um, GitHub has a developer section where you can expose your GitHub uh, to, for instance, your local Keycloak. Um, if you want to try it out, there are many tutorials to be found online because, yay, it is open source, so everybody can do this. Uh, but as you can see, you can use Bitpocket, you can use Facebook, you can use Google, Instagram. Those are already made for you. So, let us go back to the users. I have made two users in this realm. We have a... Uh, a reader and a writer. And I made also two extra roles, besides the default roles that we, of course, already have. It's a, a desk read role and a desk write role. So if we go to the reader and we go to role mapping, you see that I have added a desk read role. And of course, the default role will be automatically given by Keycloak. And of course, for the writer, I have the desk write row. Well, what does that all have to do with it? That has to do with the client that I made. This is our client. Very simple, but this is a very simple application uh, where we can um, register or like register uh, desks in a office, for instance. But we don't see anything. 
It's because it's secured. We don't have any rules right now, so we cannot see anything. Because we made sure that you only can see your data if you have the right rules. So, we are saying we want to log in. You see, like, the application that said, like, oh, that's nice. Let me send you to Keycloak. So we're now in Keycloak. Keycloak is asking, like, hey, give me your credentials. So we had that reader user that I made. Super secret password. Bam. We have our data. And we can see, we can only see details. We cannot edit, we cannot remove anything. But at least we have our data now. So if we could then go back and we log out, and we log in with our writer, We suddenly have a lot more functionalities because we have an extra role now, the desk write role that you also saw in Keycloak. So this is pretty much what the developers now also know. Eh? This is like, this is where, where, we, where we are good at. REST APIs and we give the stuff back what we can, what they are allowed to. This is what we know. For the, is everybody known about GWT.io? Couple? Anybody that isn't known about it? Yeah, it's pretty nifty. So we're going to go a little bit hacking here. Nah, it's not, it's not really hacking. So let me just uh, refresh this page. We can see here that the desks, let me just make it a little bit bigger. So it's very, it's, it's terrible to read, I'm sorry. But uh, over here, we're calling the backend to say, like, hey, I want to retrieve the desks. Uh, then the backend is like, yeah, well, that's nice, but I want to make sure that you have the right role, else I'm not going to give you back anything. So we are giving you a bearer token. That token is what we got from Keycloak. When we logged in, that Keycloak was giving back a token. So if we copy this and we paste this in gwt.io, You get all kinds of information. When does the token expire? But also, the roles of the user. It's pretty nifty. Because pretty much, this is also what our backend does. We are getting a token. We're going to read the token. We have all kinds of information. Most of the times, we're only interested in this little part. And we're just going to see, like, hey, is the role in there that we need? So try it out one time. See if you can maybe, if you log into somewhere, see if you can maybe find a, a token. And just put it in gwt.io and see what kind of information is in there. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. Uh, over here, for instance, you don't really see a lot of information besides the roles. Sometimes you get your name, uh, your email address. It depends what the application is asking for. It's also the nice thing about OpenID Connect. You can give them scopes, and pretty much in, the, in that scope, you're saying what kind of information you want in your token. Right now, we're not really interested in anything else but the roles. But say you can give a scope profile. Then Keycloak is like, okay, I'll give you the profile, name, email address, etc. All right, I survived the live demo. Yes. And then you're like, oh my God, that's nice, Keycloak, but I want something that Keycloak doesn't have. Well, it's nice, Keycloak is still open source, which means you can add your own functionalities to it. Now, I know there's not a lot of Java developers in here, just a couple, maybe, else it's the best language in the world. Just saying. Uh, but you can create plugins. 
and a, a plugin is pretty much just a bit of code based on interfaces that are already readily available from Keycloak. You just use those interfaces, you implement them, uh, you compile them, of course, everybody knows that, and then you place the plugin in the key Keycloak folder, restart Keycloak, and it's ready to use. It's as easy as that, pretty much. Because whole, the whole of Keycloak is also built on those same interfaces that you're also gonna use for your, for your plugins. So it's pretty much just extra. If you're saying like, hey, th those devs, they suck. Can be, I wouldn't say it too quickly, but yes. To make a plugin? Yes. Uh, so recently we made a plugin uh, for a client that had a, a third party login. Yeah? So it, a login through Facebook or, for, or whatever. Um, but those uh, people first had a local account in Keycloak. And then later we were saying, like, hey, we don't want the local account. We want to use the external third party account. So what Keycloak then does is like we made those users log in with the third party. Keycloak is like, hey, but I, I know this person because I, I also have data about this person. Keycloak can do that. They can combine those two. Uh, but the thing is, they also had their local password still. And the client didn't want that. They only wanted that person to be able to log in through a third party, not with the, that local password anymore. So once they connected that third party, they wanted to remove that local password that was configured in Keycloak. Uh, Keycloak doesn't do that by itself. If we connect a local user to a third party, Keycloak is not like, well, yeah, let's just remove that password. So they could still circumvent that third party login by just using their local password. We didn't want that. So what we made is a plugin that made sure that the moment that local user was connected to a third party that we removed that local password. Because that wasn't standard functionality in Keycloak. I'm not gonna say like, hey, that was a good idea from the client. They ask and we do it. <laughs> it's okay, I, I try to understand that because you have um, many options for the users and, and agents of both of Well, pretty much they didn't want Keycloak to manage the password anymore. So they only wanted to say like, oh, you can only log in through Google once you're connected. You cannot make use of any credential that has been configured into Keycloak. That was their idea. And they were like, okay, yeah, sure, we can do that. Okay. You ask, we make. Of course, we had a discussion about it. But uh, hey, if they really wanted to do it, this is very subtle. <laughs> if they wanted to do it, then uh, yeah, we do it. So we have workshops about this. We do that together with Red Hat. Uh, I think maybe a lot of people already know Red Hat, OpenShift, uh, Fedora for those in the Linux. Fedora is also part of Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat is not the owner of Keycloak, but they sure contribute a lot to the development of this. It's still open source, um, but they are paying quite a lot of developers to help with the development of this. It's also for their own good, of course. They, they are not just like good Samaritans and just like throwing money at it. Of course, they make sure they also earn money from that by offering their own services. But we do this together with Red Hat every now and then, say about every half a year, depending, of course, uh, uh, if there's any interest in it. Um, where you can come to us, we give you a workshop for free, for free, for those that don't have a lot of money. Um, where we 
give the workshop in three different tracks. One is for the developer basic, so for the developer that hasn't really done anything with Keycloak yet, how to secure your first application. That's uh, kind of like My Little Pony, but then for Keycloak. <laughs> Then the second is more the advanced for the developers. So more how do you uh, get two-factor authentication? How do you do step-up authentication? So an extra layer, et cetera. Uh, even some Ansible for those who are a fan of Ansible. Uh, and then we have a third track for admins, so not really developers, but still the people that need to turn on the knobs and click on buttons in Keycloak we say like, okay, how do you configure the users, the roles, et cetera, et cetera? How do you configure everything within Keycloak itself? So for those interested, uh, you are always welcome to join one of those workshops. So to finish it all off, if you want more information, Lee is here. He's our account manager. I'm here too. <laughs> of course, I'm more of the technical person. Uh, you can always send an email to keycloak at firstaid.nl if you have any questions, any concerns, if you want to do something, anything, you're always welcome. Uh, just don't flop my mailbox, please. I also just need to do other work. And if you're like, well, I, just, I, I want to figure it out myself, I want to like dabble with it a little bit, of course, you can always download the keycloak. Uh, but then I would also recommend get this book, Keycloak Identity and Access Management for Modern Application. It pretty much discusses all the basic functionalities of Keycloak. Um, this will help you a lot already to at least get the basics down, get your application secured, maybe even already get a third party account configured. And of course, if you need more, then we're here as experts. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you like wine or beer? Or I, um, do you drink alcohol at all? I, I, I like wine. You like wine? Absolutely. You thank you. <laughs> and something nice to eat. Oh, oh thank you. Well, You're welcome. Thank good you. Good night. Thank you, and uh, thank you all. <laughs> of course, we're here for the next 15 minutes, so if you also want to have a talk about something or if you have questions, we're still here. Yes. Yes, we now uh, got some idea how Kiko works, but the integration into Typo might be also very interesting because normally you have a existing role uh, asset management inside uh, which you can um, add to Kiko. So I have some uh, some things done with Kiko and there's some cons mm -hmm. with Kiko. What they really don't, what Kiko doesn't uh, or isn't able to do. So how to implement it afterwards? Well, I mean, so it's, it, it's... I get all the roles back, you know? Yes. So my, my idea was to, because uh, we did a lot of uh, role description and who is allowed to do what, mm -hmm. and so I get this game, this Java yeah. uh, web token back, and everything in there. So my idea was then, which is also for the type of the uh, to to get the every user, the user who logged in, mm -hmm. because I have to log in. I have to log in him after I know uh -huh, he's okay. Yeah. So I have to activate the session from him. I have my own information about him. I have to mix it up. So um, I did a second array to uh, add it to the TSFD object of the user, which is uh, yeah, Zugang. <laughs> so what he's allowed to do or not. Yeah, so entry, do, pretty much, yeah. yeah. Talked about Keycloak key and then. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I cannot say a lot about Typo 3 no. because I'm absolutely yeah, no Typo 3 expert. Uh, to hear that topic, I can talk about um, because I'm doing two examples for that. 
one for backend blockchain with uh, mapping for the backend users yeah. uh, and uh, um, groups, and also a front end blockchain with also mapping. Um, then you have a um, um, classic way with, uh, with uh, permissions of all the groups. Mm -hmm. And um, the only thing you will have to manage is the uh, groups in Kiko. Yeah. That's right. And that's all. But you have to implement it later in the software. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right, but uh, that's... Um, because that's it's not the raw concept of uh, Taiko, it goes deeper if you want it. Yeah, I don't know how it is with Taiko. In Java, we have like just frameworks that just do everything already for you. We just like receive the stuff and we only use a couple of annotations and then you're done. <laughs> you have to do it all by yourself. If you can ask if the user has a certain role and you could just Yeah, that's the thing I do. Uh, normally it is that if you define, you have to define the roles, the same, the same roles as you have in your system. Then you want to uh, you do a mapping, so we have all the roles, but you can much more be specific inside uh, some extensions. Because if you have inside roles for inside extensions, so you can show quite different things, like you did. Yeah. So uh, I don't have to manage it, I have just to, when I do a fluid template, just to think about uh, what this one should uh, see, and then I can manage it. This way. So that would be quite nice to have a practice okay. workshop on that. And the second yeah. thing is uh, Kiko is able to SSO, to enable SSO. Yes. To us. But only if you are logged in at Kiko. You could all, yes. also log in at um, Typo as a quite a normal uh, login. Then, if you have the Kiko ID of the user, you can ask Kiko to get all the additional information. That's a way around, yes. also, also possible. Yeah. Then you can't get uh, to another client, to another branch of your business, for example, an SSO. The SSO is only working uh, as you show it. If you use key clouds, yes. Because you can uh, very simply um, adopt it in the login. Yeah. So that's, uh, you can do what you want. Yeah, so it is SSO. Um, only if you're in the same realm, of course. Yeah. If you go into another realm, then then you're out of your session. Uh, you can also manage your sessions, of course, in, in Keycloak itself. Uh, I would recommend that there's only one place that manages the sessions and not that you put your sessions in multiple places. Of course, Keycloak has like REST APIs where you can get like your user information and, for instance, like your, your roles or et cetera. Uh, but I would recommend that you only put your user session in one place. So either you just do it in Typo and you ask Keycloak, hey, hey, give me the user information, or you let Keycloak manage everything by itself. But that's up to you, of course. Keycloak is able to manage the sessions of Typo because they are also cached in the database. Yeah, but unfortunately, I don't have enough uh, knowledge about Typo. <laughs> All right, if uh, nobody else has questions, then uh, let's just have something to drink.
de speaker. Ik weet niet waarom hij het af en toe wel en niet doet.
Nog niet. Nu wel. Nu beter. Good afternoon. We still have two minutes. Hou jij de tijd ook in de gaten? Hou jij de tijd in de gaten? Ik heb een klauw idee van de agenda. Een half uurtje geloof ik dat ik uh, mag spreken. Een uurtje, drie kwartier zeg maar. Goedemiddag. Goedemiddag. Goed Hallo. Hi. Hij heeft het woord in Engels. Okay, it's uh, 14.15, that means I'm uh, expected to start my presentation. And my presentation is about Odoo. Uh, I've sat down with uh, the organization of this event and I showed them Odoo and they said, just show them Odoo and give a, give a demo of Odoo and then they will understand what open source can mean for a, for a fantastic development. Well, I thought about it and I said, well, I can show you Odoo because that's my job. I only, as a salesman, I'm showing Odoo to, to, to our customers. But I thought I'm also going to give you a lot of background on why is Odoo the success as it is today? Who has heard about Odoo? You did? Yeah. That's a good, uh, that's a good point. Um, I will explain you the, the product later on. Odoo is an all-in-one business suite. It's completely open source, but with a closed, let's say, border. And I will explain you what that means. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a demo of Odoo, but in the meantime, I will tell you far more about the organization, the company, and the whole open source world. First of all, myself, my name is Bart Stelder. I am at this moment one of the managing partners of Dynaps, and we implement the Odoo software. In my past, I was slightly connected to the IT world. I'm a official COBOL programmer. So I'm one of the dinosaurs that can uh, still work with, with uh, COBOL. Also RPG, also basic, ba 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 basic, it was called in the time, and some other ancient uh, development tools. And when I look today at Python, for example, I say, well, I would love to be 40 year, years younger. And then I also became a, a programmer. After my IT, uh, I went, to, uh, to, yeah, I went into the commercial world. And that's basically what I did in the last uh, 40, uh, 25 years. I was commercially active. And since the last 15 years, I own my own companies, I have various companies. One of them is Dynaps, and I will explain you a little bit about Dynaps later on. Um, what I'm going to do is, I tell you a little bit about myself again, uh, but then in the Dynaps uh, environment. And then I'm going to immediately pop up a move to Udo, all in one. And I will give you a demo, and that demo is about setting up a company in less than five minutes with everything you can imagine. So I'm going to show you that. And also, I want to tell a little bit about the business model behind it. 
and I was just listening to the presentation next door, and there are a few things that we have experienced that maybe you can learn about it as well. And at, at the end, I will tell you why Odoo is, Odo is the success that it is today. So Dynaps is my company, and what we do, we do everything around Odoo. So we analyze, make analyzes, we do the implementation, we do migrations, development, we build connectors, we give trainings, and we do also hosting, which turned out to be a very important uh, factor of the whole Odoo environment. Odoo has, has hundreds, thousands of partners in the world. Dynaps is the number one partner in the world. We are the biggest in the world. We have more than 7,000 users in the Netherlands and Belgium, more than 370 implementations, and a revenue around 11 million, 10.5 million euro, with more than 135, I think in the meantime, 140 employees. And again, what we do is we do everything around that Odoo part, which I'm going to explain later on. Odoo is an, is an open source, all-in-one package. And that means that virtually anything you do in your company, you can do with Odoo. If you talk about bookkeeping, if you talk about CRM, if you talk about MRP, VMS, uh, WMS, about HR, about websites, web shops, e-commerce, everything is inside Odoo. So it's a huge package. And that also means that the implementation part is quite challenging. I give you a small video about So the most important sandwich of this, of the most important uh, line of this whole presentation was basically the, that Odoo is a, a community. It's a piece of software built by millions of people and literally millions of people are busy at this moment with Odoo. It are the millions of customers that we have that all contribute to the enhancement of Odoo, but also the, the hundred thousands of developers worldwide that work on this package. And the interesting part was, I said, I asked you who has heard about Odoo. There was only one guy that knew, knew Odoo. That's because they don't do anything on marketing. They only invest in the technique. They only invest in the, in the quality of the, of the work. They don't believe in marketing. If you talk to Fabian Pinkas, one of the founders and one of the owners of Odoo, he says, the product, when it's good, it will sell himself. It's a little bit to my to my, to, to my knee, 
because I'm a salesman, I know never, nothing sells itself. But I must say, when I first time looked at the Odoo, it indeed does. And that's only possible because of that vibrant, big community that's working on the, on the software. Odoo is an all-in-one package. That means it's fully integrated. So all the data in one are, is in one database. If you about talk about CRM or products or whatever you put on a single point, you add the data in the, da in the database and you can use it in every single um, uh, module or app that Odoo has, is built on. So if you make a product, you can use the products in the, in the offers, in the direct sales orders, but you can also use them in your websites, in your web shops, in your uh, cash, uh, what do you call it, um, point of sale systems, etc. It has a fantastic user interface, and that's where Odoo is very, I think the strongest point of Odoo is that, that beautiful interface that Odoo has built around the software. And that software, that user interface is in every single app or module exactly the same. That also means that it is a very high user acceptation. And I have worked with, with lots of packages. I mean, SAP, Oracle, uh, just n name them. But when I looked at this package and we saw the user interface, we said, well, this is, this, it is possible to have fun with an ERP system. Only because of the user interface only. It's a very modern package. It's open source. It's cloud-based. And above all, it's almost fully integrated with AI. And I will show you also on the demo a little bit what it means for a package like an ERP system. It's multi, multi-language multi-device, multi-company, multi-currency. It supports virtually any language in the world. It supports any, uh, all the currencies in the world. And that's only possible because that big, you, big open source community. We have in every country, we have uh, localization teams that work on the localization of this, of this software. And last and not uh, least important, it has a fantastic reporting. Uh, possibilities. So BI, Power BI, or whatever you want to use, is not really necessary because that is already inside in, inside, the com in, inside the software. I spoke to, uh, to Fabian Pinkers, who is the founder of that company. I said, Fabian, how did you know? How did how did you know that you was become that you were becoming successful? And he said, there's one thing that you should remember. If you want to succeed, you need to fix a big problem. And then I said, yeah, but what's a big problem around ERP? And he said, it's not the ERP, it's the all-in-one. This is the problem most companies are facing. And if you look at it, you probably will see it. Eh? Discuss, uh, most IT-based like companies use Slack. Knowledge and Notion. Sign, Donkey Sign, Salesforce, Lightspeed for the uh, point of sale and for the e-commerce. Accounting, QuickBooks, uh, Exact, whatever have you. Project in Asana, Harvard. Most companies have more than 15, 16 uh, packages that are working together to get all the functionality done. And the big problem is there that you have these, all these, these uh, diverse uh, packages with all the, the different uh, user interfaces, and that is, is taking a lot of effort and um, is, um, is taking away the, the focus on the business, basically. So what would it be nice if we can solve that problem? And that was basically the beginning of Odoo, when Fabienne with, her, with 20, 30 people sat down and said, Koi, what can we do? to prevent and to come up with a new solution. Uh, you probably will remember that, you will probably will uh, recognize that if you look at your own company. Um, a little bit about the uh, technique behind Odoo. I'm not a technical guy, like said, but it's fully, uh, the basic uh, platform or the basic language is Python. A JavaScript, it's based on a Postgres SQL database, and we use the QWeb reporting all open source elements that are used to build the company. Interesting about Odoo is that we have a full open source free to use version 
which is called the open source community version. Next to that, there's also an enterprise version. And when I talk about the business models later on, I will tell you, explain you why at the end, the a community of the whole uh, environment has chosen for a, an enterprise version with a licensed model. Because open source does not have to be for free. Open source has a certain value and companies can pay for that and therefore get a better service. If you look at the, uh, the at this moment, about 50% of, the, um, of the, the standard software inside the enterprise version is still open source. If you look at the um, community version, it's completely open source, but it lacks left and right some functionality, which can be uh, used by using open source modules that are available. So whatever, wh wh uh, either you choose for the open source uh, community version or the open source uh, enterprise version, you can get the full stack of functionality. But in the open source enterprise version, it's nicely packaged. In the also open source community version, you have to look in the community to find the missing functionality. Um, so we have the, the community, the open source behind it, and we have the Odoo SA. It's, it's, it's a company that is making a lot of, uh, developing a lot of functionality. And on top of that, and on top of that, we have all these third party apps. And there you find the millions of users and millions of, of hundreds of thousands of developers that are building all, all kinds of apps that are specially made for special um, environment. Um, like I said, it is, it's, Odoo is not just a company, but it is, this is important for Odoo. At this moment, there are worldwide 5,128 uh, registered partners. And that means that our partners that have um, well-trained people on Odoo, they have their own developers, and they can support Odoo in the countries. We are working in 117 countries worldwide, and we have more than 100,000 FTEs actively working on daily basis with Odoo, either on the development or on the sales and marketing and support. There are more than 40,000 93,700 apps, and therefore you, you can think about, okay, there's a company that uses Odoo, but has, for example, a Cardex system, and needs a, uh, needs a connector for that. That's what we call an app. So we add it to the, the software, and we make it available for the rest of the community. At this moment, there are more than 150,000 databases active, and we have more than 10.8 million users active with Odoo. So still, it's a little bit strange that we don't know about Odoo, but I think in the, ne in the next years, you will absolutely hear about the, uh, that company, like we have learned also from SAP. Good. I will give you now a short demo on how Odoo, how you can set up an Odoo company in less than five minutes. So if you want, you can time it. If I don't make too much typo mistakes, it, it will be less, but I will show you that. I'm going to take my seat. You can see it? Yeah. For that, you can, you can try it yourself as well. You can go to Odoo, to the Odoo website, odoo.com, and you type in pricing, and then you get on the, on the top side, try it for free. And you really can try it for free. You can build up your own company. So let's say we build up a company for a furniture, for furniture sales. They have a website, they have e-commerce, they have a CRM system, they have a sales system, they use uh, invoicing, they have a uh, POS, they have bookkeeping, uh, stock, purchase, and what did I miss? I can go up to 10 and then later on even more. Okay, let's say they also have uh, documents. And this is basically what you can do. Sorry? Is this to your website? Website. Oh, English. Uh, I can. <laughs> Wait a minute. That doesn't count with the five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I tried again. So let's uh, check it again. Um, I think. Uh, uh, just 
rename it. <laughs> that is, I think that downstairs is a button. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, one down. Okay, try it for me. There we go again. Website, e commerce, CRM, sales, invoicing, point of sale, accounting, uh, inventory, purchase, documents. And now I'll push the button, make it, then he starts asking me what is the company name? I call it Webcam. Webcam 1, for example. And if you ever use it for, uh, for your own benefits, just fill out here. I'm going to use it as a service to other companies because otherwise, Ford will give you a call and keep on calling till they sign the company. Start now. And at this moment, the company with a lot of AI is starting. So it's going to pick all these elements together to build up a complete setup of an ERP system in a few minutes. <coughs> it is not all, <laughs> even goes further, because we will see it later on. I have also clicked on the webs. And also the website, I want to have a nice website where I can sell my, show my products, but also sell my uh, products in the shop. So it will start asking me, do you want to buy and build a website in four steps? I say, yeah, I, I, I like yeah. Let's do it. So I said, a business website, and I want to have a furniture. Furniture store. Come on. Amish furniture store. Wholesaler, for example. My objective is to get leads or to develop a brand or sell more. This, so I like to have sell more. And then I say, okay, I like to have the colors as well. So what I can do is I can upload the code. So I take the webcam logo, open it. It will be loaded and then I say, let's go. Then I can say the features like about this services, etc. You can add whatever you want. And I said, build my website. And now, you can even choose one of the teams, the favorite teams. Eh? The favorite teams are, by the way, the most chosen teams you can find. So I take the first one, for example, and now it starts building up your website. So what it does, it, it takes everything which is needed and also the pictures from the, from the internet and, and whatever, if you have a company and basically there is a website and now the complete company is set up. So when I go here, for example, to the back, back office, I see everything already set up. When I go back to the website, and also there I want to show a little bit of, of AI. Uh, when I say edit, sorry, when I say edit, and I said I like to have a better cover, or no, let, let me take an extra banner here, and then I said mm, this text is not really what I like to have. I go to ChatGPT and say, mm, give me three alternatives, and I like this, al this alternative, but I like to have a little bit more lengthened, and also a little bit more professional. And then I click on insert, and the text is already inserted. I click on save, and the website is like I want to have. How many minutes was it? Two minutes, three minutes? Yeah, about it, yeah. So everything is now inside, except the data. So what I did, I took another website, but now I remember that's not in Dutch. So what I will do is I will populate the data, this website with, uh, this website with uh, some data so that you can really see how it works. Um, okay. Low demo data. Yes, I understand the risk. And now it is going to fill the complete database with demo data. And if you like to play with, uh, with it, just do it like I did. It's very nice, you can see what, how, how, uh, how it works, how, how the data is integrated in all the apps you can, uh, you can imagine. Important to say here is that, remember that more than 50% of all the software behind it is still open source. Okay? So even if you want to have it completely 100% open source and free of charge, you can have the same functionality, but you have to find a little, look a little bit around in the, in the app stores around the world. And it, when I talk to, to Fabienne and his development team, they all tell us, we can do this because of that open source community. They all help us to, to build all these functionality, come at the, the, the also the, the companies are very active in, in, in adding function, asking for functionality, etc. 
So when I look at apps, oh, I have more than seven minutes ago. Um, for example, sills. Yeah? You have the sills, you have the POS system, you have even a restaurant system with a, with a kitchen, uh, kitchen terminal, CRM, e-sign, electronic signing, subscriptions, contact. When you have time, just put a look at it and, and look what's what, uh, what happening here. So the moment I click on this install, it will immediately install this, this help desk unit, help desk um, uh, module, and it will immediately work. 100% guaranteed. So no bugs, nothing, it works. And I, you can take me to that, it works. Accounting, invoicing, accounting, consolidation, multi-company, consolidation tools are available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there is one, and this one I think, no, organization. There's one app, which is called, uh, this one, Studio. With Studio you can change any screen, any report. You can change it on the fly by just, uh, just drop and drag. If you go a little bit deeper into the system, you can also go to the Python code and you can actually code, put code, a Python code into the system. So, that's about the introduction to Udo. When I look, for example, here, CRM, and I look, uh, for example, there's a CRM system. Uh, let me see. Oh. Wait, I go, I go to sales, then sh I show you a little bit about the products, and then I stop because I have a, some other things to talk to you. When I look at products, for example, these are products that are in the system today, or in the, in the demo data, and you see here all kinds of products that you need, storable products, uh, uh, consumables, uh, services, uh, licenses, whatever. You can just add it and change it whenever you like. And nice thing is about what you ever, whatever you do is also uh, locked. You have a full accountable lock in the system about what, what who is doing. Yeah? Okay, that's about the Udo system. Now let's go back because I have still five minutes to go. So let's go back to the business model. Because the business model is, an, is, is quite an interesting story. Odoo has started with a business model, free open source, and Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm walking around. Uh, and trying to earn money with the consulting, consulting business around. And that didn't work. Company was almost, almost bankrupt, and they had to change the business model because they could not make money in this way. So in 2010, they started the license partner model, and they started to work with, like I said, in partners and licenses. So you have to pay for the software, and partners are uh, in the market to sell and market your software. It was a very disruptive model because they only ask, I think, 19 euros for everything. And that is half the functionality that we have today. In 2014, they changed it again. And one of the things you never should do is change, change uh, licenses or, or payment structures because that, that's people and customers don't like that. But we were able to explain why we did it. And the, the, the only reason to, to, to change these prices was because we needed, uh, we needed funds to fund the R&D and to fund the hosting and to fund everything around it. Despite of all that, that, that people that are working, there are still you have to, uh, you have to um, normalize all the, 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 the whole user interface you have to control all these, uh, the, the software itself with testing, automated tests, and so on. And that when you build a system like this, which is for millions of users, you have to have money for that. So he made it he, in 2014, he did it again, and he said, I'm going to sell added value per, uh, per app. Uh, so if I use, for example, the uh, e-commerce uh, web shop, which is on par with Shopify, why not ask me money for that? After six years or eight years, we change it back to the system that we have today, one price per app, pr one price for the whole suite. So users only pay, I say, let's say uh, roughly 40 euros for everything, and they can use the whole setup, every, all, the, all the apps that are in there, and that's probably the, uh, the way it will be. The success you can see here. Odoo has at this moment 
2,830 employees in total. So despite of the, the whole community, there is a company that is building Odoo. They all build, develop software, and the agreement that is made with the open by the Odoo community is that the software will the, the developed software in Odoo SA will be in will be free available in two years after the introduction. I'm not sure if they do it, but that's indeed what they promised. There are two products only, the enterprise and the community version. Also there, we, there Odoo is taking care of the community version. And uh, at this moment, uh, about 249 million euros um, is coming in per year only on licenses. And total, the free cash flow is 70 million and uh, the um, well, you can see it. it it's, it's a lot of money, but that's going in. I think the, mo the company has at this moment already a validation of 3.4 billion euros. It's the first Belgian IT unicorn. So you can make a lot of money with open source, but you don't have to give it away for free because the uh, so uh, software has a certain value for customers. Well, I think it's now 45. Are there any questions? I hope you seen a little bit about Odoo. Enjoyed it a little bit. Is there any space left for Type 3 in this ecosystem? Sure. Any space for Type 3 in this ecosystem of Odoo? <laughs> or does Odoo everything Type 3 does? Um, Odoo does everything that Type 3 does, only Type 3 does far deeper. And that's with everything in this software. Uh -huh. If you talk about WMS, yeah. warehouse management system, it does a warehouse management system, but the, the optimization. And that's the type of three also the set. So there's a DMS system in there, but the DMS system is rather basic. It's lightweight, okay. Yeah, it, it's a light, very light. Yeah. So the nice thing about being open source is that it's also very open also to connectors. So we build a lot of connectors with this. You never enter a green field. There's always, people always using something. And we always may have to make connectors. And the nice thing there is again, the moment you need a, a connector, I, I'm sure that, that there will be a type of tree or do connect. Because somewhere in the world, somebody will have built in the, in the open source. Great. Yeah. Are there tools to migrate from other systems, from sales yeah. or do and so on? Yeah. Uh, at this moment, um, I know that there are tools for SAP, for Cord, just for the finance and for the, for the stuff. But I know I just learned about Shop Shopify. I think they were told, they told us they raised the price of 40%. Yes, that is. They are working on tooling. Uh, again, it's, it's an open source group that's working on tooling to pick the Shopify shop, migrate it to Odoo, and make it exactly like Odoo, like uh, Shopify. Just Pull it empty, load it up in Odoo. All the, the screens will be the same, the, the, the workflow behind it will be the same. And that must be available one of these days. So, yes, there are a lot of uh, tooling around. And again, also in the Odoo community, uh, community uh, there are hundreds of tools, millions of tools. There are millions, hundreds of tools, hundreds of thousands of tools available. My experience, by the way, is that when you start with a nuclear piece of meat, migrating is not, not the way to go. <laughs> but that's my experience. If you have a lot of customer data, you don't go to what yeah. you by it. Yeah, yeah. But also a lot of data that you want to get rid of. Exactly. So that, that's, the, that's the payoff you have to make. But you can easily import, I mean, uh, every every. Uh, no, no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> That's my, my, uh, my puddle. Uh, every single uh, view, you have an Excel import or export. You can choose, choose whatever you want, but that's all bulk import, bulk export, and uh, connectors that are completely important. Okay. Some more questions. Okay. Um, Bart, uh, thank you very much for this inspiration session and also that this whole event is also about inspiration, sharing 
and also to get some new ideas for ourselves and to get work with. Uh, I think uh, the person that uh, wanted to go he showed the yeah, yeah. very impressive to me at the street. And you asked the example, uh, those nice shirts are built with a uh, board by an Odo web shop. So I didn't know that for years, but uh, I saw it <laughs> a few weeks ago when I ordered it. So it is around. Uh, and yeah, it gives us a lot of inspiration. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark.
Okay, two minutes left. deaktiviert eine. So. So. I think so we, I think we have just one minute left. Let's wait for the others. Maybe there's coming someone else. Why is this? Why is this URL shown on the bottom all the time? Why is this? No. Doesn't matter where I put the mouse. Okay, we have to look with that. So fifteen fifteen. Let's begin. Uh, yeah, thank you all for coming to my talk. Um, I want to talk with you about server-side tagging. Um, this is not a spelling mistake, it's not about server-side tracking, even if it implements tracking, but it's actually about tagging. Um, what I will be talking about is about um, using a tag manager, uh, kind of a way on, uh, kind of on a server-side, uh, which puts you in more control of the data that the tech manager is transferring. Um, the goal of this talk should be that I explain the concept to you, why it was introduced. I will give a demo how it can be implemented, uh, what benefits you can get from it, and if the time is, uh, if I'm good in, good in, good in time, I will uh, quickly show how to set up a simple setup with server-side tagging. So these are the parts of, the, of my talk. Ah, oh, no, not, not, okay, white, this thing doesn't like white space, okay. I, I, okay, yeah, uh, I, my name is Tim Schreiner. Uh, I w I'm a Type 3 developer in, uh, at Kahn 2 GmbH in Düsseldorf. Um, and even if I'm a Type 3 developer, this talk, has nothing to do with Typo 3. This is absolutely standalone for server-side tagging. Uh, click. Yes. So, uh, what is a tag manager? Short question. Is someone here who doesn't know what a tag manager is, has in contact with it? Okay, no one? That's great, then I will make this quick. So, uh, I think a, a tag manager is a concept that was introduced some uh, some uh, uh, a while ago to give mainly marketeers the ability to manage their tracking codes on a website and to improve it um, so that can they can uh, add the event data that will be tracked on several actions the user or the browser will execute so I will this is I think a good summary for a tag manager um, short part, how does a tech manager generally work? First of all, all I will uh, talk about the naming conventions because in the first time they might be a, bit, a little bit misleading. Uh, so it was for me. <laughs> um, so first of all, we have a, we have a taking container. A container is um, is something like a project you create which contains all your configuration. So all the configuration you do is stored in one container. Uh, second, there are tags, where the name is coming from. Uh, tags are, in a simple way, tags are just scripts that gets loaded when you load the tag manager. Nothing more, especially Java, uh, it's JavaScript. I don't think there is any, any other kind of script. And uh, third one, there are events which are 
like browser, which are browser events that, are fire, that will fire or execute the configure text. So the tag code is loaded, and when an special when an event is fired, the uh, code gets executed. This, to put it in a simple way, this is what a tag manager generally does. Um, yeah. So about the execution order, I just introduced. Um, so, base, uh, first of all, when we build a website, we get some tech manager code from our marketeers. They tell us, they tell us, hey, please put this on the website in the head tag. Um, so, uh, we do that. And this script is loading the tech manager script. Uh, for Google Tech Manager, it's, the, it's some gtech.js, uh, but there are also other tech, manager, tech, tech managers. I just want to mention that there's not only the Google Tech Manager, but this talk will be uh, mainly about Google Tech Manager. Um, yeah, as we see, uh, the website loads the Tech Manager script in the server con oh, uh, in the web container. Sorry, there's a, there's a spelling mistake. In the web container, this is the default Tech Manager setup. There are several tags. Uh, in this case, uh, a Google Anal Analytics fear tag, a Google Analytics fear event tag, and some Facebook pixel that will get loaded. Um, the website loads this data, and when the tag gets executed, uh, for example, by a page load, the uh, scripts will, uh, will be executed, and for Google Analytics and Facebook, the tracking data is directly sent to these two, to these two platforms. So uh, you have no control what, uh, where the data is going with the setup, and this is a really problem with data privacy for us, like GDPR. <laughs> That's okay. So, as I told you, problems with the uh, Google Tag Manager is, uh, now in this case. Uh, first of all, we load a, thir a third-party script which might get restricted by browser configurations, especially for setting cookies. Uh, I think this will get worse in the next one or two years, that there will be more and more restrictions for third-party scripts setting cookies in your browser. I think uh, even, Google, even Chrome is, tries to get rid of all the cookies from third-party scripts, uh, but they have some other solutions for that. <laughs> they have their own solutions. Um, as, I as I said, uh, you are, especially for Google Analytics and Facebook Pixel, you aren't allowed to load these scripts directly without content of the user. Even the Tag Manager script, I think you aren't allowed because when loading the Tag Manager script, your IP address is directly uh, submitted to Google by loading the Tag Manager, Tag Manager script from their server. So even this might be a problem. And the third, the third problem is the content security policy. Um, yeah, the content security. Uh, I consider that as an advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will come to that. Right, right now, I think <laughs> it's a good thing. So, I, in my opinion, the, the, the tech manager was introduced 10, 12 years ago. 10, 10 or 12 years ago. Then marketeers has control over what scripts they want to load on their website, um, which wasn't a great time, I think, for developers, especially when you look into performance of a website and some marketeers are pumping in Java scripts. In, in the worst case, they found them in some, on some website. This is a cool script, paste it there, and uh, uh, faster than you can see, you might have some Bitcoin mining on your own website <laughs> because the JavaScript is loaded. So, uh, in in terms of uh, security, the, con the, con the content security policy was introduced, um, which gives us, gives the developers the, back the control what scripts can be loaded. So even if uh, the marketeers put new, uh, new scripts in their tech manager, the developer has to allow these scripts in the content security policy. So yeah, uh, uh, one one for developer and marketeers. Uh, now I introduce the server-side tagging, which ships around the, uh, which can ship around this 
uh, the content security policy a little bit. Um, we s uh, uh, how it's done, we see in a short time. So uh, server-side tagging. Uh, to put it simple, it's nothing more than a, than a, than a, than a proxy. So uh, every data that is transferred from Tag Manager to the website and from the website back to the Google Analytics or Facebook platform can be proxied by this server container and you can um, transform, you have full control of the data, you can cut out data, you can add data, you can change data that is uh, sent uh, to and by the client, also the browser. Um, the great benefit is that the, all the scripts can be delivered from a custom domain. So when we have the website kam2.de uh, from our company, we uh, can load the tag manager from uh, tracking.kam2.de. Uh, which uh, gets rid of the problem with third-party cookies because now it's a first-party cookie. It's from the same domain, just a subdomain. But, it's, but it counts as uh, first-party. And as I told you, um, when data is sent, you can uh, transform this data in real time. Uh, we will see an example later on uh, what it can be used for. Uh, especially, in, uh, especially for privacy concerns. So, the uh, server-side tagging. Um, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to keep the data on your server, you need to host the server-side container somewhere. Um, Google by itself provides a special wizard where you can host it on the Google Cloud platform. Uh, but you're also able to host it on your own server using a server using uh, Docker images. Google provides for their server-side containers uh, Docker images, which are node-based. Um, you can set up these on your server. It's quite simple. Uh, I will hopefully show this in the setting up demo later on. Um, and uh, next step is you have to configure the tech manager containers to use this, uh, your own uh, server-side tagging container. Uh, yeah, I think that's basically it. Oh, that's all. So, 15 minutes in, it's demo. Well, it was a little bit quicker than I have thought, but it's okay. We might have time for the setup process then. So, hmm? or more discussions. Uh, so, good point. Are there questions till now? Concerns? <laughs> yes. The image is provided by Google. The yes, correct. Yeah. We must trust Google that there is no. Nothing done with the data. I thought that this question would come up. Um, <laughs> by now, I have to say yes. Um, I couldn't find the source code how the container is built. It is hosted on its on uh, Google's uh, registry platform, but couldn't find the source code. You can look into the Node.js files in the inside the container. So they are they aren't encrypted, but they are uh, um, minified. So <laughs> isn't isn't that cool? Yeah. We can't look into the Linux which is running it. So maybe uh, your Linux is your own server. You can the set up this on your own server. No, I the Docker image. The Docker image is based on a most Linux. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. So the image here. We can't look into the VM itself. There's something done. So we must trust uh, Google that they are doing nothing equal with the data which is provided yeah. to our host. Yeah. Are Mostly, there yes, yeah. similar containers from other providers? So uh, I haven't found them yet, okay. but they should be. So Google, um, Google mentioned that the server-side tagging is a concept and then and they provide an image you can use, but you should be able to use other images. 
but the information of the how to build such an image are very rare to, to not present, I think. The tagging itself is still done by the browser. The tagging is done by the browser? And you will see that? to my own Docker. So it's some Correct. kind of semi server side tagging. Correct. Okay. So it's called server side tagging. <laughs> um, I can give an explanation why I think they named it this way. Um, but yes, I think it might be a little, it might be a little misleading in the first place. Uh, the expectation might be something else. I totally can understand that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is a demo site I set up. Um, in this site, we have um, server-side tagging script implemented. Then we have two testing server containers, uh, two, two, um, two tagging containers, sorry. We have, a, we have the mentioned server container and the web container, the, uh, which is the default one uh, you create when you uh, do norm, uh, normal tagging, let's say that. So, so uh, what happens now is, oh, Wait, uh, on the first thing, I will open analytics. So, so let's see. I try to explain what what we will see now and what is conf, uh, conf, configured here. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, there is a notice that the user data is not anonymized. Uh, the example will uh, be able to anonymize some of the user data that uh, Google uses to identify the user between in, inside a session and between sessions up to its I, IP address. We are able to anonymize this data completely before it's sent to Google. And as a little proof, I can show it in Google Analytics in the real-time ana analysis. Um, for every request we do now, we get a new user. So every request is a new user for, for Google because this data will get anonymized. I can sh so I will reload three times. After this, I will show uh, I, I will give the insight in the configuration. So now the real time analysis will take a few seconds, up to a minute, I think, till we see it there. Hopefully, I see three requests, three users. <laughs> yeah, come on. Three, three users. We have this because every user is. Uh, every request is a new user for Google. So, um, the configuration, uh, sorry. I will close this. Um, this is the, so. This is the typical web, web container you might know from Google. We have uh, tags configured. There are some tags paused. Please ignore these tags. These are experimental tags from myself, but uh, we have a Google uh, an, uh, Analytics fear, a four configuration, which I think is nothing new. Uh, uh, come, I, I, will, I will explain now. We have uh, additional configuration parameters here, which tells Google Analytics that we use a server, a server container so that the analytics scripts will get delivered by the subdomain and not by Analytics. Uh, I think it's analytics.google.com, I think. So this is the only change we have here. And everything else is just, is just default. We have a, a trigger for Google Analytics, and that's it in the web container. In the server container, so the server container introduces the, 
the concept of a client. So that's the part where I try to explain why it's called server-side tagging. Um, the server container expects some sort of request uh, you put, uh, you send to the container. So um, the, the, this container has its has, has, uh, has its own URL, and you can send requests re uh, requests to this container. Every every request you like. Um, then there are cl uh, there can be clients which can capture this request. They can check: Am I able to process this request? And these clients are uh, in um, uh, need to convert this request into into an event, and this event is then sent to um, is then sent to the or, or uh, sent to the triggers, which might execute this event and fires the uh, corresponding tag. So in short way, this is the concept. Um, there are clients uh, for server containers, but only for, I think it's just for Google Analytics 4 and the GTM web. There aren't much clients there. You can see Google Analytics 4. There, there's the old universal analytics, which is deprecated the web container, and that's it. So in the web container, uh, you, configure, uh, you configure your um, container ID from your web container um, so that when you load your, um, your, G, your, um, your container in your, on your website, you will load it directly from the uh, from your custom URL, and it the request was will, will, will be sent to the server container, and this client will uh, will capture this request, and will send back to you the uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the container's JavaScript. So uh, it's it's the same JavaScript you will receive if you. Uh, if you would call the web container directly, like in uh, default configurations as uh, that are done normally. Um, second client is the Google Analytics client. This client is um, uh, will capture every request that is sent as a collect request. So Google Analytics when you want to track some data in a, let's say in a, uh, the default page view data, when a page gets loaded, a page view event is fired. And this event will, be, will not be sent directly to Google Analytics with server-side tagging. It will be sent to your tagging container. That's why we uh, had the URL configuration in the web containers Google Analytics, so that um, the analyst, uh, an analytics script knows that it should use another URL to send the requests to. This client will capture these collect requests and uh, will build an event from it, which is then sent to the Google Analytics platform. But uh, between building the event and sending the data, you, are, uh, uh, you can uh, change the data in any way you want. Uh, I will show that two, but first, yeah, we have uh, even in the, uh, uh, also in the server container, we have uh, events triggers, which are uh, quite most, uh, which are uh, less than in the web container, because here we are listening to e just uh, for events, the client will generate from the, from the request. So the Google Analytics, creates an event, which is called uh, page view, for example, page underscore viewed in, uh, uh, in lower cases. And then this trigger will listen to this event and then fires the Google Analytics 4 tag, which will then send the data 
to Google Analytics to the platform. So I hope you can see that now. I will open the network tab so that, that we can have a look at the requests that are sent here. I hope it's, oh, I think it's not that good, <laughs> but let's see. So, uh, all right. I will start here. This request above here, it's a little special Google Ana Analytics. I, I can explain it, it later, but uh, here, uh, in this request, the tag manager gets loaded. Uh, it says gtag dot uh, slash js, and then some query params uh, behind it. And the response of this is the default Google Tag Manager script with it uh, with its data data uh, data you can use. And um, this request, I just want to say. As far as I can, uh, 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 I examined is not directly proxied to the web container. Um, the request will end up in the server container. The server container will pull the will pull the script from the web container, and then deliver it back so that the IP address is not uh, passed to Google Analytics. How uh, how I uh, examined this is uh, with the Google Analytics uh, preview mode. <laughs> I can show it to you. Um, so hopefully this is uh, all correct. <laughs> so um, so the tech manager script gets loaded with uh, uh, together with the tech manager script. Wait, wait, wait. No, this one. Are delivered the Google Analytic tags from the web container you, con you configured there, also with its Trigger. So it's the same as I would call the, um, uh, I would load the tech manager, tech manager script directly from Google for this container. Um, the next step is the Google Analytics script uh, will get executed uh, because of the page load. So Google Analytics by default has a, a page loaded event which then sends the page view track event. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, this request. Uh, this is also sent to the, uh, to the tagging server. And the last request is just a scroll event. So when you load Google Anal Analytics, it first sends a tracking uh, a page view event and after three, four, five seconds, it will send a scroll, uh, a scroll event, even if you haven't scrolled. So it's just be, uh, it's just be, uh, just the behavior of the Google an uh, Analytics script. Um, so we can see this request in the preview mode. Uh, the server container and the uh, also have a preview mode like the web container. Uh, Loading. We can have a look at the requests. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> That's the problem with live demos. Yeah. Not coming up. Oh, okay. Now we see something. So. I will reload this page and then we should get data in the Tag Manager debug. Should get. Ah, now. So, um, so this is the request that which loads the Google Tag Manager script. It's the gtm.js. Uh, and let's skip to here. So here we have the page view uh, event, which is fired by the Google script in the first place. We see that this, uh, that this event, this page view event, fires the Google Analytics text, which is configured in the server container. And um, this is all the data which is sent to the Google uh, to the Google Analytics platform. So we have a client ID, 
This is the ID that Google uses and is stored in a cookie on your, on your browser uh, to identify the user between sessions. This cookie, I think, has a lifetime of one year. We have the session ID to identify a single user inside the session. We have a session number. This is just an um, increasing number by the events the user triggered for Google Analytics so that the events of one session can be put in order. And last of, uh, last of all, I think we have the IP address from the user at the end. I think these are the uh, data that, is, that, um, that have the, my, uh, the most privacy concerns. Every other data, we have the user agent, we have the page location, I think this is all more generic data. But this is the data that, is, um, uh, that should be concerned in terms of privacy. So this is the original, uh, original value and we have a final value. As I, uh, as I was saying, uh, we are overwriting these values with transformations. That's just generating for every event, we are generating random numbers. We, uh, we give Google some random numbers so that uh, every user will be you, uh, a new user to, to Google. And we also overwrite the IP in this case just with some local default IP. Yeah? Per request. So when the user, uh, let's see, we have this number is starting with, with 977 and 166 for the page view event, event. Then we have the scroll event. We can look into this too. And we have different numbers here. So every event the user triggers on Google Analytics, Google Analytics will think this is a new user with uh, yeah, this is a new user with some data. And the statistics are still valid? No. <laughs> 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 so, um, that's a good question, of course. Um, this, is, this should be an example of what is possible with server-side tagging. You can think of, hey, I might be able now to track users without consent if I anonymize all the data. If this is legal or not, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you could have this, you, you, you might have this thought. Um, but as Ingo mentioned correctly, um, you might get problems with your uh, Google Ana Analytics data because for Google Analytics, every event will be a new user, so you have a lot of new users for your site when you implement this. There might be solutions for this. One solution uh, can be that you uh, will track into different data streams in Google Analytics so that, so, so that you have a data stream for, uh, 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 for uh, data given with consent, which, is, uh, uh, quality, uh, which, ha which has a high quality. And you might have a data stream for track data without consent, which uh, should be handled carefully, but can be used to check uh, how often has a user clicked on a, on, on a special button. So, but might not be used uh, in context, uh, yeah, how many new users does my website have weekly? So, uh, of but course, you can, you can talk with your privacy lawyer <laughs> and discuss if it's also possible to, to yeah. give a random number to each user. Yeah. But of course, uh, data quality is something you should keep in mind when implementing this. Um, there might be customers where, you, where the customer says, okay, page views or, I um, don't know the English uh, terms for, for everything. Um, Aren't that, in, aren't that important for, for me. I just want to know how often was this form submitted on my site. And if this is the only metric the, uh, the, the customer wants, uh, there should be no difference between tracking with and without content in this case or with an, an anonymized user. 
because the event is always triggered a single time. Uh, okay, uh, so I can uh, unanonymize, uh, I think I've switched the buttons, sorry. Uh, I can un unanonymize the user and now it's the default tracking behavior for Google Analytics. When I reload, let's say, uh, yeah, it's looks, it looks fine. So when I reload three times and we wait a few seconds, I should have I should have only one new user here because let's see, yeah. So we have one new user, and when we have a look into the into our uh, page view. the uh, data is not getting anonymized anymore. So I will give a quick look into the transformation, how we are doing this anonymization in this example. And then I will try to show you the setup in a really quick way. Uh, so um, the transformation, there is an, uh, the, uh, the uh, server containers has a beside, beside the client. They have a um, configuration for a module called transformation. And here we have a user anonymized transformation, which is uh, quite simple. So uh, in the event data, I will switch this tab back, we see that every data has its event uh, has its has every data has its name. So and we can use this name and Overwrite its value. Uh, we have a condition when this uh, transformation should be executed. So uh, in this case, uh, I created a, a variable um, which I switched just with, the ja with some JavaScript. And uh, if this value is given, it anonymizes the data. For client ID and session ID, we create, uh, I created a, a, a custom variable to generate a random ID. You can do this quite simple with uh, Google and with examples we find on the web. So you can use transformations with conditions to modify, add or delete data you don't want to send to Google Analytics. But I can tell you if you delete the client ID, Google Analytics will not track this person. So it is, it, 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 uh, it was not showing up in real time tracking. That's why we uh, modified it. We generated a random number in, uh, instead of deleting it. But of course you can, just, you can use this to modify the user agent string if it uh, leads to concerns as, uh, for the privacy officers or every, everything you want. Some questions for this. If not, I will jump into a quick uh, uh, step. No? Okay. Um, yeah. Configuration. So, as I told, you need to create uh, two containers. Uh, I think it's just here. No, I can't. What? Uh, ah, yeah. Great container. And when creating a new container, you have you can choose between web and server. So first of all, we create a server container. And look at server. I will leave this open. And uh, on the second, we create a web container. So, now we have both containers. When creating the server container, Google Analytics provides you in a wizard, as I said in the beginning, to, uh, um, to provisionize um, a fully configured server-side container uh, inside its own Google Cloud platform, so uh, which is scalable with Kubernetes, I think so, and so on. 
or you can tell Google, hey, uh, I want to set up this manually, then you get this configuration string. With this string, you can Uh, you can spin up your Docker images. This string has to be given as an environment variables into the Docker images. I will show. Uh, uh. So, uh, I have a Docker compose file here, which is, it's a really simple file. It's not long. Uh, uh, Let's see, uh, does this work? Yeah, yes. cool. So um, there's only one image that is, uh, so no, oh, sorry. We have two services, we have a tagging container and we have a preview container. Um, you need both services in order to run uh, server-side tagging, uh, uh, server tagging. The preview container is used for the preview uh, I, sh I showed you and the tagging container is the endpoint for tagging. This container can be configured multiple times if we want to scale it up. So you can have multiple of these containers for one uh, server-side container. And you uh, configure a preview URL you want your container to use and the config string for this and for this. And for the preview container, you just say run as preview server two with the same image and you're done. Uh, it's, now I have to get, I have to shut down my default containers <laughs> because of uh, port conflicts. So five, five minutes left, yeah, I think. Right. Yeah, I see. Uh, why does it take so long? <laughs> ah. Okay, so now we have both con both containers running. And so this is the default script for Google Analytics, uh, for the container, you don't need that. Uh, now, CD, uh, SST, I have my index HTML, which is the page we just saw where I changed the tracking behavior with the with the nice banner. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, this is the tag manager script we are using, which is the default tag manager script you uh, you get provided when you set up a new web web container. Just the URL is pointed to your own server side container with your server side uh, tag manager uh, ID. Uh, container ID, sorry. So uh, it should be this URL. Yeah. Uh, come on. Uh, come on. Uh. Yeah, so. Okay. So we should just replace that. Um, yeah. And now the basic setup for a tech manager is done. Now you can start configuring your, your tags in the web container or, uh, and your client's tags and triggers in the server container uh, to set it up the way you want. So to round it up, um, I want to go back to the content security policy. So as, I, as you saw, now every request is done by, uh, uh, is, is using the subdomain of your own, of your conf configured server container. So scripts can be loaded without having additional content security policy, which is, uh, which is I think good and bad. So your content security policy can be way smaller for this because you just have this one subdomain where every tracking is done and don't need to have these six, seven, eight Google domains which you need to have uh, Google Analytics 4 
uh, uh, together with the tech manager. But I think this cannot be set up without a developer, especially when you're going beyond Google Ana Analytics tracking, because there are only clients for Google Analytics right now. So when you want to do a Facebook tracking pixel, you have to write your own JavaScript, which captures the re request. You can use the Google Analytics, the Google Analytics request for this, capture this, transform it into a Facebook compa compatible event, and then uh, fire the Facebook tag for it. But this code you have to write on your own, but someone might have done it, so you might find some examples on, uh, on, on GitHub or GitLab, but it is not provided as a default, conf, uh, default client configuration you can just add to your server container. Your server container just have a few configurations, so in my opinion this is just, uh, this is in, this is more a concept right now uh, with very few examples, but it isn't, but I think it's an interesting concept which might uh, help you with some privacy issues. Uh, you will get, uh, especially in the next years, when you, tr uh, when you, want, to tra uh, you wa want to continue tracking your users with Google Analytics or Google Ads for conversion tracking. So yeah, I think that's all of mine. So conclusion, yeah, better, better, better privacy, but as we saw, it requires a deeper investment of time and also expertise to set up all this, especially when you want to do more than Google Analytics. Yeah, it can be used for better privacy, but it can be used for yeah, worse privacy, worse privacy if you can. I, I can now oh, just block oh. all Google domains uh, on my own. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Of course. I can't do that for this. Yeah, of course, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can, you can block uh, slash collect requests, so every, by default, every request, uh, every request is done to the slash collect endpoint, but uh, for the server containers, there are uh, paid services, third-party services on the web, which provide you with the server containers, not, not, not Google, there are other third-party services, and they provide you with features like, hey, you can randomize this endpoint. <laughs> so yeah, then uh, uh, blocking this request on, let's say, with a PIO or some, something like this, uh, it is way more difficult. Yes. Okay. So thank you. If someone wants to talk about it, even with uh, with privacy concerns, let's talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a local one, so enjoy it and uh, something uh, ah. delicious to eat. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Have the beer genomen? We have it on the wine.